<laughs> Thanks, Ben. Hi there, everyone. Welcome and happy Monday to another episode of Study Hall brought to you by Napa Valley Wine Academy. Uh, I'm your host, Christian Ogenfuss, and I'm really excited about today's uh, edition of Study Hall. Wine trivia should be very fun, uh, interactive as well. And today we have two hosts of wine trivia. So let me bring them uh, up here on screen for you. We have Peter Marks and Catherine Bouguet of our education team. Welcome, uh, Peter and Catherine. Excited for today. See how we score. Over to you. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much, Chris. Good. So we're going to have three different sections today. I will be covering round one and round two, uh, and then I will turn it over to my friend uh, Peter Marks, who will then also lead into the answers uh, for, uh, I mean, it lead into scoring for our questions today. So let's just dive right in. Let's go ahead with round one, grape expectations. And Catherine, Question. if I could just uh, just interject real quick. Uh, there will be a total of 24 questions. And as we go along, we'll reveal each of the answers. But if you would like to play along at home, uh, make sure you write down your answers or at least tabulate how many correct answers mm -hmm. you uh, identify. And then at the end, we'll give you a little summary of how you do. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So we will reveal along the way. Uh, okay, great. And we were going to wait for you to put your answers in the chat box. So please do go ahead and add in your answers. Okay, round one, grape expectations. Question number one. Syrah and Grenache are often blended together in Spain. Which grape is adding more alcohol and body to the blend? Dun, 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 dun. Okay, if you have a, a guess, go ahead and put it in your comments uh, down below. We'll give you a couple of seconds to enter those in. I don't know about you, Catherine, but I'd love a glass of that wine right there. I absolutely agree. Okay, so why don't we go ahead. Uh, let's see, we have a couple of answers coming in. Um, here. One of each. <laughs> one, one of each so far. Okay, uh -huh. okay, oh. they're starting to roll in. Oh, yeah. Great. Okay, Catherine. All right. The answer is, drum roll please, Grenache or Garnacha as they call it in Spain. Uh, Garnacha builds up high sugars in the vineyard. And so those high sugars translate into high alcohol. And of course, the high alcohol adds more body to the wine. While Syrah does have body, it's more known in the blend for its color and its tannins. That's what it particularly adds uh, to the blend. So the answer is Grenache or Garnacha. Okay, ready for question two. What is the main grape of Hermitage? Is it Grenache, Pinot Noir, Syrah, or Merlot? Okay, again, go ahead and put your mm. guesses or the correct answers in the comment section. Had some great responses last time. Mm -hmm. We'll give you a couple of seconds here to, to answer it. So just repeating the question, what is the main grape uh, of Hermitage? Okay, they're starting to roll in. Okay, we have some consens consensus here. Okay, Catherine, I think we're ready for the answer. All right. The answer is C, Syrah, because, of course, with Hermitage, we are in the northern Rhone, and Syrah is the only allowed red grape uh, in the northern Rhone. It's when you get to the southern Rhone that you start to see blends as a big category. So you'll see in the southern Rhone is when you get the, you know, Garnacha, Mouved, and Carignana, and many other different grapes. But it is Syrah for the northern Rhone. Ready for question three. Which one of the following is a black Italian grape variety? Is it Verdicchio, Trebbiano, Alianico, Copino Grigio? Okay, again. All of this make me thirsty. 
again, put your guesses in the comment uh, section. And, and again, as Peter said at the top of the show, make sure and tabulate your correct answers. So the final reveal. Okay, we got them rolling in here. Awesome. What, is there a consensus? So far, Alianico. Okay. Yes, there's pretty much a consensus. So let's go ahead and reveal. Wait, we've got we've got a smart group on our hands. The answer is C, Alianico. Of course, this is a, a grape known for deep color, high acid, high tannin. It's the star grape in southern Italy. Well, you'll find in Campania, you know, it's in the Tarazzi, DOCG, or in um, Basilicata, in Alvianico del Volterre, DOC. So a, a well-known and, and much prestigious grape of southern Italy. Next question. This is fun. Which one of the following is not a noble grape variety of Alsace. Which one is not? Riesling, Pinot Blanc, Muscat, Pinot Gris, Gewürztraminer. Okay. This is a toughie. <laughs> Which one does not play those reindeer games? Okay. A little hesitancy here. Go ahead and put those. Ah, here we go. Ah, Things cool. are rolling in. We have uh, a vote for uh, Pinot Blanc, Muscat, uh, Pinot Blanc, again another Muscat. Looks to be between those two. Someone did say Gewürztraminer as well. Okay, I think it is uh, time for the answer. And the answer is B, Pinot Blanc. So bravo to you guys. <laughs> And this matters in Alsace because the um, noble grape varieties are uh, regulated in certain wines, like the specialty styles, Vendange Tardive, or the Selection de Grand Noble, the SGNs. Um, those wines require uh, one of the noble grape varieties, um, as does Alsace Grand Cru, which has to be 100% of one of the noble grape varieties. Uh, are there exceptions? Yes. Um, it can drive people studying the region crazy, um, but it also makes the wine world intriguing. Anyway, answer Pinot Blanc. Ready for the next one. Which is the predominant grape in Rosé d'Anjou? Is it Cabernet Franc, Grulieu, Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec Gamay? Okay, we got a smart group with us today. Go ahead and put those answers in the comment section. I was going to say, these are getting hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got some uh, answers coming in. We have uh, B seems to be the um, predominant answer uh, currently. We have a Cabernet Franc in there as well. Okay. Did all these people study with us? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I'll go up and reveal. So the answer is B, Grill U, which is a, a high yielding black grape variety um, in the region. The, the wine itself, I'll just say for a minute, you know, is um, on the sweeter side, as is um, Cabernet d'Anjou, which you wouldn't think given the name. Um, so Cabernet um, d'Anjou is, is the most prized and the sweetest of the rosés. If you do want a rosé, we're talking about the Loire Valley, and if you do want a dry wine in the rosé from the Loire Valley, you would pluck a rosé de Loire um, from the shelf. Okay, ready for the next question. Okay, coming up here, one second. There we go. Which of the following is the signature grape variety of Spain's Rueda region? Is it Verdejo, Vira, Alberino, Garnacha Blanca? Okay. Waiting for some answers to roll in. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> so, Verdejo, we have a couple of Verdejos, a Viura, another Viura. Uh, but the consensus right now seems to be Verdejo. Yep, Verdejo is, 
Someone put Albarino. Okay, so go ahead and reveal. All right, the reveal is A. It is Verdejo. <laughs> Verdejo is a, a higher acid grape, citrus, stone fruit flavors, very Sauvignon Blanc-like. So if you love Sauvignon Blanc, you have to try Verdejo. Um, but Rueda is an interesting region because it is surrounded by these big red regions. So you've got Toro and Ribera del Duero making these big, beautiful reds. But then there's Rueda that's getting some um, at elevation. It's got some cooling in influences that um, allowing it along with picking early and other techniques to make this beautiful crisp white wine. Most of them are unoaked, but there's always somebody playing around and adding oak uh, in the wines. Okay, ready for the next question. Which of the following grape varieties forms the backbone of a red Doro wine? Is it Alvarinho, Trincadera, Cabernet Sauvignon or Toriga Nacional? Okay, all you smart That's folks out there. Red Doro wine. The next episode of this, we're going to have a little music track to go along. <laughs> yeah, I think we should. Okay, we have a Turigas Nacional. A lot of Turigas Nacionals. A lot of D's coming in here. He seems to be a consensus here. Well, D is not a bad thing in this world. <laughs> okay. In fact, the answer is D, Toriga Nacional, which is sort of the star grape variety. Whether we're talking about Doro's fortified, you know, the port wines or the non-fortified wines. So deep in color, high in tannin, very intense flavors. Um, of course, it can be blended with many different grape varieties, um, but some of its, you know, big partners, um, Toriga Franca, oh, there's, there's many, um, Tinta Ruiz, but um, Toriga Nacional is the, is the backbone. Okay, ready for the next. Which is the main grape of sherry? Albariza, Palomino, Fino. Perez. Okay, all you sherry lovers out there. Got a smart group here, Catherine. <laughs> Good, I'm impressed. Uh, we need tougher questions next time, it looks like. Uh, you know what, we're going to have to have another one. You up for it, Peter? Yes. Okay. We actually have um, several instructors who created a lot of um, questions for us. Uh, um, Liz Pernat, Monica Vescovi, um, Chilla Cato. Oh my God, we have, um, you know, Peter and I just had so much fun uh, creating trivia questions and the team is just amazing. Okay, we have a consensus here. Uh, mm -hmm. Palomino, we have a couple of people um, with uh, Jerez, uh, but looks like predominantly the answer consensus is B. Okay, the answer is B. These are very smart, very smart folks. Um, so Palomino is the grape. Albariza is a type of soil. Fino is a style of sherry. Jerez is the name of the region. And Palomino takes up the majority of plantings uh, here. It's actually a grape where its wines don't have a lot of character, but that's actually perfect for the creation of sherry because all of its personality comes from the maturation. Of course, the a special maturation process in sherry. So I believe that is it for the great questions. Okay, so it's off. Uh, switching over here to Peter. Uh, actually, I'll do round no, two. Peter's okay. going to do. I know you're all waiting for Peter. He's coming. Um, yeah. But Peter is. Um, Peter has uh, round three, and then the um, um, talk about the scoring. Okay. So round two, what's my vector, Victor, <laughs> or grape locations? <laughs> so let's go ahead with question number one, Kuna what? In which country do you find Kunawara? Okay. We're not even giving you choices here. We just want to see what you say. So the answer to Kuna what? Go ahead and place that in the comments section. Uh, we got some rolling in. OK. 
Okay. All right. And the verdict is? Well, the verdict here is Australia. Yes, hands down. Okay, I think this was one of the easy ones, <laughs> but it is Australia. In fact, it's in the South Australia state or zone, um, known for its terra rosa soils and creating these these beautifully expressive, big Cabernet Sauvignon wines uh, from the region. There's some sort of you know uh, influence, a little bit of maritime influence, so you've got some nice acidity as well, but known for its big, beautiful um, Cabernet Sauvignon wines which a lot of people say then has a eucalyptus or a menthol beautiful note in it. Okay, ready for question number two. In round two, where is Tokai? Where are we in the world? Okay. Where is Tokai? Go ahead and put those answers in the comments section. Okay, well, the the Mensa contingency here is answering <laughs> Hungary, so Hungary, okay. overwhelmingly. Ah, uh, what a crew. Okay, it absolutely is, is Hungary. We are in the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains, um, where you've got the, the Bulldog and the Teaser Rivers are creating beautiful misty mornings, beautiful mists with humidity. And that's allowing for botrytis. And that botrytis, of course, is creating the famous wine Tokai Azu. Azu means rotten, rotted. And so it's the consecrated, almost raisin-like berries with the botrytis flavors that make this one of the most amazing sweet wines on the planet. You've got this amazing acidity that's balanced by this sweetness and then the complexity of the wine. It's, I, I don't often drink sweet wines, but Tokai Azu is, is just a beautiful choice when you're ready for something sweet. Okay. I almost get, I almost get misty. I just listening to you talk about it. <laughs> Sorry. Not just from the rivers. <laughs> Descriptors. Okay. Which country specializes in the Gruner Veltliner grape? Which country has its point of differentiation on the world market with Gruner Veltliner? And extra points to someone who can say that 10 times quickly. Gruner Veltliner. Gruner Veltliner, Gruner Veltliner, Gruner Veltliner, Gruner Veltliner. I won't keep going. Impressive. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Still on the Mensa track? Yeah, we're on the Mensa track for sure. Even even a, uh, someone who gave the answer in German. So oh, go ahead and reveal, <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> Okay, the reveal is Austria. Austria, where this grape can produce full body concentrated wines um, with citrus, stone fruit, but also an intriguing white pepper. You know, some people call it, um, I heard an MW candidate once describe it as, as a celery salt. So I'm not sure about the celery salt, but um, the white pepper, there's just this beautiful little intrigue on the finish that makes it very exciting. Most of these wines are crisp and unoaked, but also you'll have producers that are creating some oaked versions out there. Great. Okay, ready for the next. Uh, I love the Loire Valley. Where in the Loire Valley do you find Melon Blanc grape variety? Is it in the central vineyards? Turenne, Anjou Summer, or the Nantes? Okay, a little bit tougher. Where do you uh, find Melon Blanc in the Loire? And you can see here on the on this map um, to the west is the Nantes. Then the next region to the uh, to the east of it is Anjou Samar. To the east of that is the Turenne. And then to the east of that um, is the Central Vineyards. And while it's not the Central Loire, as you can see on the map there, it's called the Central Vineyards just because it's the Sant, it's the administrative department. Um, but so called the Sant. Okay. 
So we have um, a split between uh, Anjou Zemmour and Nante. Um, mm -hmm. So go ahead and leave someone's stress. <laughs> okay, the answer is D in the Nante. In the Nantes region is where you find the Muscadet appellations. And um, those appellations, that Muscadet name also is used to describe that same great variety. It takes on actually three different names. So Melon Blanc, Muscadet, um, Melon de Bourgogne. So different names, but it comes from this region in the West, right by the Atlantic. This is the wine, you know, these wines made from this great variety are what the French absolutely drink along with their oysters. Um, you know, once I went there and I wanted a Sancerre with my oysters. No, bad, Catherine. You must drink Muscadet um, with your oysters. <laughs> and happily. Um, just beautiful, crisp, mineral-driven, citrusy wines. Okay. Ready for the next one. Round and round she goes. Which wine region circles around Priorat in Spain? So Priorat being well-known for people studying Spain, one of the DOCAs along with Rioja, Hey, you might find a clue if you stare at the map. Is it Monastrel, Toro, Monsant, or Burzo? Okay. Waiting for some answers. Okay, we have Bierzo is is one answer someone gave. Monsant, Toro. A couple for Monsant. A couple for Toro. So we're all over the map. Literally and figuratively. Um, <laughs> okay, so, but there is some consensus building here that it is Monsant, um, with Toro being being the second. Um, someone has some Monastrell as well, so go ahead, alleviate some more stress. All right, the answer here is C, Monsant. Monsant is an incredible area. They actually have these great, great Mediterranean influences, but at the same time, there's lots of elevation. They're making um, Syrah, Grenache blends, um, just beautifully expressive wines that seem to just almost have this little smell of, of the Mediterranean. Um, just a really beautiful area. You can see on this map here, um, Falset. Um, towards the south. That's their ba their big city. There's there's no big city really, but um, their town, the food, the restaurants there are incredible. But you actually, when you walk in, the first thing pretty much you drink is vermouth. Vermouth. Um, you have just a beautiful glass of, of vermouth on the rocks. Oh, that's what we should be having today. Okay. So answer is C, Monsant. Next question, oh, so suave. Is suave wine made in the Veneto or Piemonte region of Italy? The Veneto or Piedmont? Okay. Waiting for those answers to roll in here. Okay. So far, all answers have been Veneto, with the Piedmont uh, sneaking in there. Veneto, Veneto, okay. Ready for the reveal? Let's do it. <laughs> okay, the answer is the Veneto. It is actually a hotbed of wine activity. Valpolicella is also made here. Um, maybe... Peter, can we give them extra points if they answer one more question? Sure. <laughs> What's the great variety of Suave? Ooh, okay. Bonus question. Bonus question. For round two, name the great variety for Suave. The principal. Great. The principal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Clue. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Should I just yeah. go ahead and review? Yeah, no, we have we have an answer. Someone, two, three. Okay, smart group, smart group. Go you, ahead. They're Catherine. even spelling it right. Which I is know. Amazing. Oh. I I hope Google did not have a have a hand in that. <laughs> <laughs> it is Garganiga. 
Garganica. Okay. Okay, we ready for the next two more questions in this round? In which country do you find the Weinviertel DAC? Which country do you find the Weinviertel DAC? Okay. How's it looking? It's looking good. We have a Germany, we have some Austria, we have Holland. Uh, Austria. People are in the right area. Switzerland. Someone posted an Austrian flag. Another one said <laughs> Germany. Okay, go ahead, Catherine. I love this group. Okay, so it is in Austria. It is in Austria. In fact, it's the largest uh, wine growing area there. And it's actually Austria's very first DAC. I don't know if that was a clue for some people, but DAC is sort of a calling card um, in Austria for a region. If a region could decide on a grape or grape varieties and a style of wine, then they could designate DAC. So that when a customer goes and grabs a bottle of that, you know, DAC wine off of the shelf, they know what to expect, what grape varieties and what style uh, to expect. So with the Wein Viertel, um, they decided on a Gruner Weltliner. And so their classic style is, is a dry, um, um, unoaked um, Gruner. So delicious, more delicious wine we're talking about. So Wein Viertel in Austria. Last but not least, Puy to that. <laughs> <laughs> is Puy Fusse found in the Cote Chalonese region? Okay, I love the title alone, just makes you smile. Puy to that. <laughs> okay. Puy Fusse. Not to be confused with Puy Fume in the war. So. Is Puy Fusse found in the Cote Chalonnaise region? We have some no's. We have some yeses. Predominantly right now, uh, I would say the no's are, are winning. The response. Okay, so we have more no's than yeses, Catherine. All right, I'm ready. Yes, the end. Well. The answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no. Um, so it is not in um, the Cote Chalonnais. It is in the region south of that, in the Mackinac. And in fact, this Puy Fusse has amphitheater-like limestone slopes that act as a sun trap. So the Chardonnay here can take on even this beautiful tropical fruit uh, flavors. So just big, full-bodied, beautiful, generally oaked um, um, Chardonnay wines. Lovely, lovely. Uh, just for just extra, you know, uh, tips. In the Cote Chalonnais, you actually have four wines um, that are pretty well known. And the way I like to sort of describe it um, to my students, it's sort of silly, but I'll repeat it here anyway. Why not? Um, but when I'm telling them, hey, the four main areas in the Cote Chalonnais to remember, I say, hey, um, you know, the first of those is Rui. And Rui rules, I know, it's geeky, but Rui rules because they make all different wines, white, red, sparkling. And then you have Mercury. Well, if you think of the gauge and the temperature, the red, it's known for its reds. Okay, this one's the worst. Then the other region is Givry. Give me more reds. I know, it's bad. But <laughs> somehow I think it helps people remember. And so they're also known for their reds. So give me more reds. And the last one is Montigny, which I don't know if you, for you, but I think of mountains. And what do you find on the top of mountains? Snow. Snow's white. They only uh, make white wine uh, there. So that's how I remember those. But anyway, the answer is no. It is in the Macanay for Puy Fusse. Huh. And now I'm going to turn over um, to Peter Marks for round three. Have fun with it, Peter. You left me with the dregs. All right, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, in this last round, we're going to look at 
could be anything. So go ahead to the first question, Christian. All right. Trombaton is a sea, a river, a wind, or a region? So which of those four possible answers? Okay. Well, we got... I almost can make a song from that, too. Yeah. So we have <laughs> the first response coming are coming in. Uh, quickly, while we're waiting for those responses, people loved your tip on memorization of the the villages in the Cote Chalonnais. Okay. Okay, so we have um, overwhelmingly C uh, so far. Good, good. Well, the C's have it. That is correct. It is a wind. And it's similar to the Mistral wind. It, this is a wind, the Tombaton is a wind that actually uh, is kind of accelerates between the uh, French and Spanish Alps and the massive central part of France, whereas a Mistral is between the massive central and the Alps um, over by, by uh, Switzerland. Um, it's a wind that comes very, uh, very strong through the region. It's a cold, dry wind, and it helps to keep the vines um, from getting any mold or rot. And it's typically this Traumaton wind is found in the Languedoc region of the southern part of France, whereas the Mistral is more con continuous with the uh, Rhone region. So they're very similar, but they just kind of come from different directions, north uh, to uh, from the north to the south. Good. So everybody got that one. Very well done. So here we go. Which U.S. president set the policy that only United States wines could be served in the White House? Was it Lyndon B. Johnson, JFK, Richard Nixon, or Donald Trump? Okay, here's a here's a tough one that most wine students yeah, probably wouldn't wouldn't be studying on a regular basis. So right. excited to see what responses you come up with here. So go ahead and put those in the comments. This might section. lower the curve a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think the dregs are good fun. Okay, we have. Well, we have an, all over. Uh, we have them all over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the correct answer, by the way, is Lyndon B. Johnson, good old LBJ. Now, even though um, he was the first to bring U.S. wines into the White House or mandate that they could only be U.S. wines, he actually pre preferred bourbon. You know, being from Texas, I think that's uh, understood. Being from the South, uh, Richard Nixon is famous for uh, the fact that he would drink great wines and then serve his guests to something much more inferior. Uh, he really loved Bordeaux wines. And then Donald Trump, I think most of you know, he's a teetotaler. So, uh, but he still serves American wines in the White House, which is good. Okay, so our next question, please. This is a true or false. So you have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. When it comes to food and wine, parent, food causes more problems than wine. Is that true or false? Does food cause more problems than wine? Okay. Another one I'm very interested in hearing the answers yeah. to. So far, we have a yes. I guess that means true. Yeah, we'll accept yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, we have true. Good. A lot of trues. A lot of trues. Good. Well, it is indeed true. Yes, true is correct. <laughs> <laughs> little pause for effect there. Um, yeah, so this is the main culprit when it comes to wine and food when things don't go right. The food can actually throw the wine completely out of balance. And one of the things that typically causes this, not always, but typically it could be umami. Um, and another possibility could be sweetness. You know, if, for example, think if you have like a, a wedding cake and you're at a at a wedding when they serve the champagne uh, as a reception and toast. If you're drinking a dry champagne, you have it with the sweet cake, it's going to throw that wine totally out of balance, make it taste sour and not very good. Umami can do the same thing. It can throw the wine out of balance. And if you want to know more about this, I'll do a little plug. We recently completed a course, a short course on the Academy of Wine uh, website called Drink Any Wine with Any Food. And you can learn everything you need to know about this. But in the meantime, let's go on to the next question, please. So what type of fault is primarily caused by 
246 trichloral anisole. Say that 10 times. <laughs> I'm trying that one. <laughs> yeah. So is it uh, acetaldehyde, geosmin, or captants, cork taint, ropiness, or ladybird taint? Okay, I got to move our picture out of the way. There we go. Thank you, Christian. So we got an, got six possible answers to think about here. Lady Bird taint. Isn't that what uh, Lyndon B. Johnson would get in sometimes in his oh. wine? <laughs> <laughs> da -dun -dun. Good one. Okay. Yeah. So come on, folks. Let's see it's some like, answers. Yeah, it looks like most of what I can see. It looks like a lot of folks are going for the old good old court taint. Okay. And that is correct. You guys are good. I guess, like you said, we've got a lot of smarty pants out there today. We sure do. Yeah. Um, just to give you a little background, acetaldehyde is a compound that typically shows up uh, when there's oxidation. So it sort of has a nutty, sort of bruised apple character. Uh, geosmin is typically caused by bacteria in the soil, and it gives a kind of musty, moldy taste or aroma. Mercaptans is a sulfur compound. Um, garlic, um, onion skin, very strong. You know what cortain is. Um, ropiness is caused by lactic acid bacteria. And um, it, too, is just an off character. And then lady bird taint is, uh, is kind of a uh, sort of a um, earthy, um, kind of earthy, dank, dank sort of uh, aroma. So there you go. There's a lot of things that are not what you want in a glass of wine. So hopefully you can avoid all of those. <laughs> okay, uh, Christian, we'll go to the next one, please. Which vine tree method is shown below in that picture? Is it A, Lyre, B, Guillaume, C, Scott Henry, or D, Gobelet? Okay. Let's see what we got. See if we've got any here. vineyard people out there. Okay, we got a couple of votes for the Goble D. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. Seems overwhelmingly to be the answer. These folks are not being fooled easily. And, and it is indeed Goble. That's, uh, or oftentimes it's called head trained, where you can see the the vine just has is grown sort of like a head, and when it fills out in the growing season, um, it's also sometimes called a bush vine because it just looks like a bush sitting there in the vineyard. Lyre is when you train the vine in sort of a V uh, to capture sunlight, help spread the canopy out so you get a little more sunlight and, uh, and more free flow air to prevent from any uh, type of uh, mold disease. Guillot is a French term, which is uh, the cane pruning method, which is uh, put on a wire. It can be one or two wires, depending on uh, how many vines or how many um, canes you have trained onto the wire. And then Scott Henry is an interesting one, which the purpose is to, uh, again, uh, make the canopy um, more open uh, to sun and to airflow. But it grows in both the upward di direction as well as downward. So... Up and down is what the Scott Henry is all about. Great. Next question then, Christian. True or false? You should polo polish a glass for a sparkling wine just before serving. So if mm -hmm. you're going to serve a nice glass of sparkling wine, should you polish the glass just before you serve it? True or false? Okay. See how many people have a guess for this one or the correct answer for this one? Another true or false? Okay. Mm -hmm. We have uh, an A, mostly B so far. False, false. We have some true. So, yeah, a little bit all over. A little bit of Okay. Yeah. This is a little tricky one. Uh, the answer here is false. And the reason is that if you polish a glass, you actually build up some static electricity. And if you're going to serve a sparkling wine, uh, that can kill or interfere with the bubbles in your glass. And obviously, part of the enjoyment of 
having a sparking wine is to see the bubbles as they uh, flow up from the uh, bottom of the glass. If you're serving an, a table wine, a still wine, it wouldn't really matter. But with sparkling wine, it's best to do the polishing at least a couple hours before so that you can avoid any static electricity killing the bubbles. All righty. Good job, everybody. We have a couple more. So the next question. Where's the best place at home to keep a bottle of 2018 Chateau Margaux for 10 years? If you're going to keep it for 10 years, where is the best place to store it? So A, in your garage, where it's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter and 72 in summer. B, your hall closet, where it's 60 Fahrenheit in winter and 72 in summer. C, under your staircase, where it's 50 degrees in winter and 72 in summer. Or finally, D, and I'm not sure if everybody can see that, but I will read the answer. In the kitchen, above the refrigerator, where it's 70 degrees in winter and 80 degrees in summer. Let me read that one again because it might be hard to see. Kitchen uh, above your refrigerator is the answer for D, where it's 70 in the winter and 80 in the summer. So in your garage, under the, uh, in the hall closet, under your staircase, or in your kitchen. Okay, we got, we got C, a B, mostly C's, with a couple of B's in there. Mm -hmm. Lowest temperature, so a B, another C, so yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, the answer is actually, might surprise some of you, it is B, the hall closet. And the reason is that there's less variation in the hall closet than it is on your staircase. You can see uh, only a 12 degree variance between winter and summer compared to the staircase where it's a 22 degree variance. Now, the reason is, uh, and you probably hear this a lot, when you, when you store a bottle of wine, the temperature should be constant. Because every time the wine warms up or then begins to cool down a little bit, um, it can, if you remember from your chemistry days, when something begins to warm up, it puts pressure, the molecules begin to move more rapidly. And that puts pressure on the cork, which can actually push the cork out a little bit above the neck of the bottle. When it cools, it, the pressure drops and the cork can actually begin to contract back into the neck of the bottle. So over time, if this happens, you get a pushing and then contracting of the cork, which can lead to the cork um, becoming loose to allow air to get in and wine to leak out. And you know, one of the things that I often look for when I'm buying a, a, a bottle of wine, particularly an older bottle, you know, you look and see if the cork is level with the um, with the lip of the bottle. If it's pushed in a little bit or sticking out, it could be a sign that there's been some variance in temperature. It's not necessarily a sign that the wine is bad, but it's just something to be aware of. And again, if you can minimize that variation as you can under the hall closet with only a 12 degree difference, that would be the best uh, scenario. That's a fun one. Yeah. And then we have one more in this dreg session. <laughs> so what is the wire cage called that covers a bottle of champagne? Is it a cabalot? Is it a cajo? Is it Maillard or Mousselet? Okay, hey, that's a good one. We, 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 we. So we have uh, D's. A lot of D's coming through. Okay, so far that's the consensus. All right, pretty good. We have an A. Okay, so I would say uh, go ahead and reveal. And the answer is D, Mousselet. Mousselet is the name for that wire cage. I don't know, one of these days it's gonna show up on Jeopardy. If it was <laughs> the final answer, I wish I was on the show, but it, it's, it was actually invented in the 1800s, um, obviously to keep the cork from pushing out. Um, a and B are just words that I made up, and uh, Maillard <laughs> is named after the Maillard reaction that can take place uh, sometimes, particularly with a, um, a bottle of sparkling wine. So go ahead. Now we've had those are all the questions for today. If you have been keeping track, please go ahead and do a quick summary or addition of your correct answers, and then we'll give you a little summary of how you've done, depending on how many correct answers you have. 
Okay. Again, a very smart group with us today. You, we're going to up the ante next time around and have some <laughs> yeah. tougher, tougher questions uh, for you. We'll have to do that. That'll be fun. Okay. All right. Should I go ahead and reveal the last sure. slide, Peter? Okay. okay. Final. Make your summary. Okay, here we go. So if you got zero to six correct answers, um, well, we hope you like to drink wine because a glass would probably be a good thing to have right now. <laughs> uh, kind of make you feel better. Um, so this is just uh, you know something that you have fun with. Don't take this too seriously. Um, and I think that one of the things you can always say about wine is that you never stop learning. If you scored between 13 and 18, well, you're pretty wine savvy. In fact, I would say you've probably read more wine books than Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. You know, even though they make wine, they probably don't know a lot about it. So 13 to 18 is pretty smart. If you've got, oops, um, somehow those got moved. I just realized those are inversed. It should be seven to 12 for, the, uh, for doing pretty good. If you were scoring between 13 and 18, well, then you are quite the wine expert. I don't know if I'd want to do a blind tasting with you in a, in a blind alley because you're pretty scary. <laughs> you're pretty darn good. And then finally, if you've got 19 to 24 right, well, consider yourself a wine expert. You're probably already a WCT diploma or maybe a master sommelier um, or maybe you're just a really smart cookie. Um, but anyway, if you've got that many right, then congratulations. And uh, if you enjoy learning, but by all means, take one of our online classes because there's a lot of different opportunities to choose from. So there we go, Catherine. Any final words from you? No, that was just good fun. I think we have a challenge. We need to come up with some tough questions for the next one. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, what fun. Um, thanks so much, everyone. And thanks, thanks to Catherine and, and Peter for coming up with those great uh, trivia questions. I think we had a lot of fun today. Uh, thanks for joining us. A reminder that we'll have another study hall session coming your way on Wednesday uh, at 2 p.m. And uh, once again, thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. And we will see you back here on Wednesday from the entire Napa Valley Wine Academy team. Thanks so much and cheers. <laughs>